Nimen Hau and welcome to the Cinema of the DFF, Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum. My name is Laura Teixeira and I'll be accompanying you throughout this lecture and film series until July next year. As uh, many of you already uh, know, we started last week with the first uh, event of this series. And um, for those who don't know, we uh, now have the leaflets of the program there um, outside. So in case you don't have one yet, you can pick up uh, one program. Here are already all the lectures until next year, July. As you know, this is a long running pro program. Um, but I will also recommend everybody to check out our website, which is also online since this week, uh, www gia-tsanke.de and there you will also find updated information. So whenever we have any changes in the program or we're going to definitely be adding some other films as like accompanying programs to this lecture series and all this information will be in the website. So I really warmly recommend you to check out the website for news um, and of course I'll be also informing you whenever we have other programs uh, related to the lecture series throughout these months. Um, yeah, tonight we're going to see a very special film, a film that is not uh, very well known, or at least not a screen that often. Um, ja Junkers, um, well, we can discuss where it's his first film. Uh, well, anyway, we're going to know more about that in the lecture tonight. But it's a film he did as a student in the Beijing Film Academy in 1995. And um, we'll have the, the, the luck to know more about the film or some other ideas around this film in the lecture of tonight from uh, Daniel Fairfax that is here tonight with us. And um, I just, as a reminder for those who are um, visiting this program for the first time in this lecture and film series, we always start with the lecture first. So this will last about uh, 45 minutes and then we're gonna have a short break as usually, so that you can um, go out a little bit, have some drinks up from the cafe that's going to be open still, and then we start with the projection of the film. And after the projection, there's always a Q&A. So I also invite you all to stay, um, and you can ask questions about the lecture, about the film, and we'll have a discussion then afterwards. Um, Professor Hediger couldn't be here tonight. He's uh, having a family emergency, and that's why I'll take over the his task now, which is uh, the honor to present tonight's guest, uh, Daniel Fairfax. Uh, he's an assistant professor here at the Goethe University. Um, he earned his PhD in uh, film studies and comparative literature from the Yale, Yale University. Um, his research focuses on uh, French film theory uh, post-68 uh, and um, his uh, monograph, uh, his book, uh, The Red Ears of Cahiers du Cinéma, will come out uh, probably next year. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Daniel is also an editor and a writer for the film journal Sense of Cinema, and I also warmly recommend you to check out his text over there. Um, yeah, and please welcome with me Daniel Fairfax, and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Laura, for uh, that beautiful welcome, and thank you to the DFF for inviting me uh, to talk. Um, as part of this uh, series. Uh, I'm honored to be able to talk about Zhao Zhenke, uh, a filmmaker who I have a deep and profound uh, respect and abiding love for, uh, as a filmmaker, not as a... <laughs> uh, the title of my talk, uh, Zhao Shan, Going Home, uh, again, apologies for the pronunciation, um, Beginnings of an Auteur. Uh, I just want to foreshadow that it commits two of the major cardinal sins uh, of any uh, contemporary uh, film studies academic working today. Uh, two of the things you should always avoid if you want to be a self-respecting figure in the field uh, in, in you know, the year 2019, namely auteurism on the one hand, the figure of the auteur, it's been under attack uh, for many years now, uh, and then uh, I guess teleology on the other hand, the idea that uh, we can only or that we should primarily appreciate uh, beginnings for being precursors to, to something else, something later and something therefore better and more developed and more refined. Uh, so there, there is, you know, a lot, a lot can be critiqued about this title and possibly my talk. Uh, what I want to say though is that uh, the thesis that this, uh, that this title promises, uh, the idea that Shaoshan going home, uh, kind of this, this 
uh, one of his first films, uh, if not his first kind of like um, kind of somewhat feature length film, uh, do form the kind of roots of Jar Jar, or do constitute the roots of Jar Jar Kerr's later uh, aesthetic development. Uh, this hypothesis will be both espoused in my talk and then maybe departed from, if not possibly even critiqued. Uh, while I definitely would uh, agree that there are profound resonances between this film in particular and uh, Jar Jar Kerr's later work, uh, I would also argue that the film deserves to be considered uh, on its own merits and treated not just as a precursor to these later, better films, you know, with more funding and, you know, kind of technically superior films and made by a more mature filmmaker, but that this is a film that really deserves to be considered uh, uh, on, a, on its own basis, on its own standing uh, as, a, as, as, um, as a film in its own right. Uh, and that if, and I don't want to get too morbid here, but if Jia Shang Ke had never made a film again after Xiao Shang going home, he'd got involved in some horrible accident and died or whatever uh, in some parallel universe. Uh, this is still a, f a film that warrants your attention, that warrants watching, and that warrants uh, really taking a kind of detailed, uh, considered um, uh, uh, approach to and critical response to. Uh, <coughs> it, w it is a student film uh, made while he was still studying. Uh, and in some ways, it is an archetypal student film. It has some of the qualities that we often associate with student films, the kind of uh, technical roughness on the one hand, the kind of overt signs of its, uh, let's say, uh, less than um, generous budget uh, on the other hand. And, you know, some of the things that uh, you know, some people might find a little bit grating about the kind of archetypal student film, uh, this a certain... Uh, let's say, uh, kind of use of effects for their own sake, possibly. Uh, but uh, I would also argue that it's uh, actually a surprisingly mature film. For someone who was 23, 24 when the film was being made, uh, this is a film, uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, a film about youth, a film about being young, a film evidently made by a, a young filmmaker, a filmmaker just starting out. Uh, but also, I think there is really a, a kind of... Um, profound sense that we're watching uh, the work of, uh, uh, of someone who's already developed uh, their own ideas about cinema, their own aesthetic, and so on and so forth. Uh, in that sense, I actually think, uh, the well, I would compare the film to two other kind of uh, debut works, or first-time feature-ish feature, feature -ish films, at least. Uh, one uh, some of us would have seen last year, um, or at least in the last uh, lecture and film series, uh, namely Jetu Il El by uh, Chantal Ackerman, also made when she was extremely young and extremely precocious. I think she herself was only 24 or so at the time it was made. But that I think there was a general consensus in the room when it was screened here as part of our Ackerman series uh, that it was, it was, you know, it was uh, already an incredibly mature work and that, you know, there was something, there was, as, as I think Professor Hedegger said, uh, she doesn't put a foot wrong in the film. And uh, maybe we can go that far with this film, but I think a lot of feet are put right uh, to twist that, um, to twist that saying. Um, uh, the other film possibly that I think it has certain resonances with uh, would be uh, Akatone by Pier Paolo Pasolini, also a first time film uh, made in 1960. Pasolini was a bit older than Jao Zhang Ke and Chantal Ackerman. He was already 40. He was already a well-established literary figure. But in some senses, he was also a cinematic neophyte. Uh, and that come, there's an incredible rawness to, to Akatone, but also an incredible kind of sophistication that I think is an interesting combination that we also find uh, in Shao Shan going home. Uh, it's also, I think there are also thematic resonances, the character of Shao Shan, the, the titular uh, figure of the film, uh, bears certain resemblances, let's say, to the character of Akatoni in, in Pasolini's film. Um, there is an interesting anecdote about Akatoni that I, I think is possibly germane to this film as well, that uh, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, who was uh, working on the film as an assistant director, uh, this was before he'd started making his own film, so he was just starting out in the industry, uh, he recounts that Pasolini, in the middle of making the film, uh, took his cameraman to one side and said, ah, oh, you know, I have this crazy idea. Like, why don't we bring the camera really close to, to the actor's face? Uh, 
and the and the cameraman was like, "You mean do a close up?" And I, and Pasolini was like, "Ah, so that's what that is. All right, yeah, let's do a close up." And Bertolucci said, "Oh, this is." It was as if I was watching the in, the second invention of the close up in the history of cinema. And there's a sense that uh, while Zhao Shengke, he was a, a film theory student and kind of student of film history, probably a lot more knowledgeable about film technique at this age than than Pasolini was uh, when making Akatoni. But there is still that certain idea of this is someone really like. Excited to be holding a camera and to be, you know, to be to be making a film, to be capturing things on camera, and, and just kind of luxuriating in in the ability to experiment with with the possibilities that were open uh, to him. Um, I would also argue, uh, and this is where I what I will come to kind of at the end of my talk, but this kind of sneak preview now that this is a, a quintessentially '90s film. Uh, it's a real snapshot of its time and. Uh, I mean, we we can also debate the cultural specificities of that period uh, between kind of the 1990s as a decade or as a period uh, experienced in by young people in China versus uh, the same period experienced by young people in the West, such as myself. Uh, but there was this is also the period when there started to be a kind of cultural intermingling between between the two, and where kind of um, we start to see the beginnings of a kind of globalized culture that makes its presence felt across the world. And that is something that I think this film really um, very uh, intriguingly documents. Um, so and that is a quality of the film that I think really comes through and that I think um, kind of regardless of your cultural background uh, is, is something um, that we can appreciate. And, you know, I will admit that my cultural background is very different to that of of Jia Zhang himself, of the kind of um, of the of the world portrayed in this film, but I still think there is um, the ability to uh, in in a film like this to go beyond those kind of cultural uh, let's say differences. Uh, so just a few things about the film: uh, it was uh, shot in 1994. Uh, set and also, as I understand it, filmed in the period leading up to and immediately afterward after uh, Chinese New Year. So the kind of big uh, holiday festive period uh, in China uh, was f completed in 1995. So obviously, post production uh, took Zhao uh some time uh, and kind of had this, uh, I guess, well, has had this kind of semi uh, official existence as like. Some, sometimes not really considered part of Zhao Chunker's oeuvre. Um, the, his following film, Pickpocket, as he's often declared, you know, this is his feature debut. Uh, but, you know, this is still uh, evidently uh, a Zhao Chunker work. Uh, he was uh, studying film theory, uh, as I noted, at the Beijing Film Academy um, uh, while making this film. Um, as Vincent noted uh, last week, uh, he chose film theory because the, with a, like the, the numerous clauses for that course was the lowest. Uh, so that meant he could get in, uh, which is not the case anymore, let me tell you, uh, in film studies, certainly not in Frankfurt. Um, we take only the best and brightest of students uh, in our department. Uh, he, but this is, I, th I find this interesting because this gives him, uh, obviously if he studied film studies, film theory, that made him a much better student of, of cinema than these people who are in the production courses and so on and so forth. Because while they were learning how to kind of use a camera, he was watching Bresson and Eisenstein and, and uh, the Italian neorealists uh, and learned cinema by watching cinema and, and, and talking about it and thinking about it. Uh, a, a slightly provocative stance there by the way, in what I'm saying. Uh, he, he says he was exposed uh, broadly to a huge sweep of international cinema while studying at, at the Beijing Film Academy, French, Italian, Soviet, uh, obviously China, the history of Chinese cinema as well. Uh, also noted that uh, Mao's lectures on art at Yan'an were very present in the, in the courses. So this was a kind of, uh, even in 1994, still a kind of official doctrine uh, surrounding artistic production uh, that governed a lot of uh, uh, kind of, um, I guess, uh, the instruction of, of the arts in China. Uh, we can maybe get into how uh, how Mao's lectures on art are reflected in the film, but notably the very first image of the film uh, it shows a kind of like a woodcut engraving of uh, Tiananmen Square with the kind of silhouetted portrait of Mao there in the background and a, a man holding a camera uh, in the foreground, so there's a it's, it, there's a signposting at least of a, a kind of reference to Mao, albeit a, 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 
probably an ironic one. Um, the film was made with virtually zero budget, um, basically out of uh, Zhao Zhangke's own pocket money. The equipment used was borrowed from the Beijing Film Academy. Uh, we can very much see this in the quality, uh, like on a technical level of the film. Uh, just a warning now, the, I mean, we're going to see something that's very rough. Uh, we shot, uh, as far as I understand, on analog video, so incredibly grainy uh, image, which comes through in the um, kind of digital uh, projection we'll be watching. Um, evidently, too, there was uh, possibly not the highest grade sound recording equipment uh, because a lot of the film... Uh, is kind of a lot of the dialogue in the film is is semi inaudible, uh, and Zhao Zhangke compensates for this by providing um, Mandarin subtitles uh, for all of the dialogue. Uh, also motivated, however, by the fact that the film, uh, the majority of the film, is spoken in Shanxi dialect, uh, which I understand is is difficult to comprehend for a lot of people from different parts of China. Um, so a kind of double reason there for the for the use of subtitles even in Chinese, and then we'll get the benefit of a second layer of subtitles in English um, to um, help us through the film. Um, that said, there is a, a beyond the well, this, the subtitles I think create a very interesting. Even if it was done for kind of very pragmatic purposes, I think it does create a very interesting uh, effect in the film. Uh, the way the subtitles are graphically presented. Um, and I, the way they kind of sweep across the screen uh, is, is, is gives the film a certain pattern, um, and this is uh, bolstered by the kind of actual, actually, the kind of a use of title cards, so intertitles, uh, which is kind of a very in, uncommon technique, but that Jiao Zhangke makes use of here. Um, so made made on a on a on an absolutely no budget, as with basically uh, on a, a kind of bare minimum in terms of technical standards in terms of crew size and so on and so forth. Uh, but I would argue that Jia Zhangke here, uh, as he will do actually in, in his subsequent films as well, is turning economic necessity into an aesthetic virtue. So he doesn't shy away from the low budget nature of the film. In fact, that becomes the kind of core or the essence of the film. Uh, and indeed, there is a kind of, uh, let's say, an affinity or a resonance uh, between the very visible economic status of the film and the status of the main character who is kind of uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of similarly lowly uh, economic position uh, within Chinese society as this film is uh, within the context of, of the film industry. Uh, the cast is pretty much exclusively non-professional actors, uh, mainly friends of uh, Jia Shenke, who, who he could convince to kind of, oh, he could rope in to play in his film. Uh, Jia Zhangke himself makes a uh, kind of cameo appearance um, uh, late in the film uh, as, as one of the protagonist's friends, uh, uh, which is something he would actually do kind of actually uh, pretty frequently throughout his career. We often see him uh, pop up in his films in various cameo roles. Um, but most notably, the titular character, uh, Xiao Shan, is played by uh, Wang Hongwei, who was uh, a close friend of Zhao Zhangke's and a fellow student at the Beijing Film Academy, and who would go into actually feature in six of Zhao Zhangke's films overall, the, um, mainly the six following films up until uh, basically every film up until about 2008 or so. Uh, most prominently, prominently, he was the uh, star and eponymous uh, kind of character in Xiao Wu, uh, also known as Pickpocket, made in made directly after Xiao Shan going home. Uh, in 1997, and in some ways, in these two roles, uh, we could possibly interpret him as a cipher for Jia Zhangke himself. Not that I want to offer an autobiographical reading of the film as a kind of compulsory interpretation, uh, but there are certain, uh, uh, let's say, common uh, points between what we know about Jia Zhangke's life at this time and what we see uh, on screen in, uh, in Xiao Shan Going Home and Pickpocket. Um, there are obvious affinities between these two films, uh, between Xiao Shan and Jia Zhangke's first proper feature film. Uh, both films, as I noted, feature Wang Hongwei uh, as a kind of young, aimless drifter eking out an existence on the margins of Chinese uh, society. Uh, both characters uh, hail, uh, like Jia Zhangke himself, from Shanxi province. 
Uh, in some ways, we could even see Pickpocket as a sequel uh, to Shao Shao and Going Home. The characters' names are similar, albeit not identical. Uh, they you know, share the same kind of mannerisms and gestural traits as one another. We could even s- kind of con- conceive that in uh, Pickpocket, the uh, protagonist of this film has returned home uh, to his home province uh, and uh, kind of through one of any other options has to resort to a life of crime that kind of leads to a kind of final humiliation in that film. Uh, in Shao Shan Going Home, by contrast, uh, Wang Hong Wei's character's field of possibilities is still rather more open, so it's not this kind of uh, kind of tragic uh, fate that, uh, the char- that the Wang Hong Wei's character will um, suffer in the later film. Here he is a migrant labourer living in Beijing, uh, and thus a kind of member of this uh, kind of uh, sub-proletarian uh, class upon, upon whose super-exploited labor, much of China's rapid economic growth in this time, the 1990s, but going right up to today, uh, has been predicated. Um, in this sense, he forms part of a, of a kind of underclass within Chinese society, uh, but also uh, a kind of subculture that, uh, you know, there's a sense in which uh, there's, there's a kind of almost a, an internal diaspora uh, that that, um, that Xiao Shen is part of, of people f- hailing from the same uh, same town as him, uh, who are primarily the uh, kind of uh, figures he encounters in the film. Is a sense that he's operating within a kind of displaced uh, microcosm of his um, of his hometown. Um, so Xiao Shen, the character, is not. Uh, a traditional proletarian, industrial, blue-collar labourer, but rather a kind of precarious, casual worker. Uh, we see him initially uh, working as a kitchen hand. I just might... Uh, yep, here we go. Uh, and a, at a kind of, um, you know, in the, in the kitchen of a restaurant. Uh, but he is summarily fired by the nouveau riche uh, restaurant owner, um, who we can see here. Uh and we even get the details that Zhao Go Qing, 26, manager of Hongyan Hong Yang restaurant, uh, who's dressed very snazzily in comparison to how we would see uh, Xiao Shan being dressed, uh, but also has a kind of contempt uh, for, for his workers and has no compunctions about um, sacking Xiao Shan for uh, su- supposed uh, kind of laziness. Um, uh, after after being fired, uh, Xiao Shan seeks to return home to visit his family uh, for the New Year, which is this kind of uh, mass ritual in China, as I'm sure a lot of us know. Uh, it's often touted as the kind of largest um, human migration, uh, you know, largest regular human migration that hundreds of millions of people uh, originally from rural backgrounds return to their kind of home towns and villages uh, who, you know, who live in cities uh, the rest of the year. Uh, and there's this kind of uh, uh, mass movement of people in the, during this period. Uh, the problem for Xiao Shen is that he lacks any means of actually making it uh, back home or, or leaving uh, Beijing. Uh, so in, in lieu of, uh, of, of undertaking this voyage, he simply meanders uh, kind of uh, directionlessly through the streets of Beijing, a cigarette stub, uh, perpetually kind of drooping from his lips, uh, and the, even the even the kind of the gait, the walk that uh, Hong, uh, Wang Hongwei adopts for his character is kind of uh, illustrative of of that char- of the protagonist kind of shiftlessness and aimlessness. It's kind of like he he shuffles along the footpath uh, without any sense of that he's actually going anywhere in particular. Um, instead, there's this uh, just a kind of meandering around the streets of Beijing. Um, he encounters, you know, in the, in the course of these wanderings, uh, friends of his, acquaintances, uh, women who he seems to have various romantic uh, relations with, uh, albeit none of them particularly committal. Uh, but like, uh, and I'm going to throw in a, 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 a kind of gratuitous literary reference here, like the protagonist in Kafka's The Castle, uh, he essentially makes no progress uh, towards his goal. Uh, This is, uh, in a sense, the film uh, does not move forward in any sense. Uh, We simply see this kind of, these wanderings. um, And uh, the film, 
in many ways, the film kind of formally uh, adopts, let's say, the uh, the the personality traits of uh, of the protagonist Xiao Shen. Uh, and in, in taking inspiration from that, I've adopted the, uh, the 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 personality traits of Xiao Shen too in my talk by being uh, meandering and aimless. Uh, <laughs> just like sabotaging my own talk here. Xiao Shan is, uh, I would argue, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Xiao Shan is the first in a long line of drifters in Zhao, Zhe, Zhao Shanker's work. Uh, this seems to be a very regular character um, that appears throughout his oeuvre, uh, right up until his latest film, Ashes Purest White, where Zhao Tao, uh, his muse, who has does not yet make an appearance in this film, uh, actually has a kind of similar character trajectory uh, to, to the protagonist here. Uh, this idea of not having a goal, simply moving for the sake of moving, uh, not necessarily knowing where to go, uh, but, but, but being propelled forward by whatever uh, kind of motivations that seem to remain generally rather obscure to the, uh, to the viewer. Uh, so as I said, the film's narrative structure mirrors this aimlessness. It has a loose, episodic quality. There's a kind of only a very minimal th narrative thread holding it together. Uh, but I would argue that this looseness should not be equated with sloppiness or amateurishness on Jia Zhang Ke's behalf. Even though this is a kind of student film, a, a very early film in his career, uh, we should not uh, simply understand uh, this, the, the looseness of the film as a result of someone who wasn't kind of capable of, of delivering a tight work. I think this is a very, uh, this is first of all, a very deliberate aesthetic and narrative strategy on Zhao Zhangke's part. And there is also, I would argue, actually a very highly structured quality uh, to the film. The narrative effects of this endless wandering uh, is consciously sought after, and it is also uh, in some ways actually uh, kind of contrapuntally uh, combined with actually quite uh, deliberate and, um, and, um, and, 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 and structured uh, use of uh, imagery and sequences and, and, and editing and so on and so forth. Um, in fact, I would argue there is a kind of a, a formal arc of the film that uh, kind of begins or, or, or turns from abstraction towards kind of more a more naturalist or realist uh, 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 visual quality. Uh, of course, it starts with in this highly abstract uh, sense with this woodcut. Uh, then there is this kind of black and white sequence uh, beginning the film. Uh, some of the shots actually during the sequence foreshadow later shots that we actually kind of see in the, in the narratives of the film, this uh, being one of them. So we see this film initially in black and white and then uh, something like 40 minutes of screen time later, it, it recurs. Uh, then, however, there is a cut uh, to color. Uh, it's a very drained out and desaturated image, but it is color. Uh, and uh, from this point on, the film will kind of, uh, I guess, uh, move closer and closer towards a kind of uh, naturalist or realist aesthetic uh, uh, before ending again in, in black and white. Um, so, we, so at the end of the film, we cut back uh, to black and white and back to a kind of, it's one, one might say a greater sense of abstraction. Um, there is therefore a kind of tension between uh, realism and anti-naturalism in, in the visual aesthetic of the film. And this is something that I think is indicative of uh, Zhao Shankar's work as a whole. Uh, he has himself actually stated that uh, surrealism is the best way to account for the reality of China today. Reality in China is so surreal that you have to, uh, even if you're a, a filmmaker with a profoundly kind of realist uh, approach, as I think Zhao Zhangke is, you have to incorporate doses of the surreal or the unreal or the, or the um, anti-natural in your films to, to account precisely for that, um, that reality that, you, that, um, uh, that is Chinese society in the present day, in the People's Republic at least. Um, so this, this kind of tension is operative across his oeuvre, but is already signals here. And I think this is, you know, one of the clear, um, you know, qualities or, or, or real um, kind of highlights of the film. Let's say uh, the realist aspect is denoted in particular by the rough handheld camera work uh, in the film, the use of long takes, which will be a kind of uh, hallmark of Zhao Zhangke's 
uh, aesthetic on the whole. And also the frequent periods in the film essentially have narrative dead time without any notable action or narrative development. Um, in that sense, they, you know, they could come across as, um, as, as tedious or boring, but actually I think we get r- real uh, insight and vision of uh, a kind of uh, Chinese life at a particular moment in time, uh, 1994. Uh, the, the shots, nothing might be happening narratively or very little might be happening narratively, but they're teeming with life. They're teeming with a kind of profusion of details about um, this particular place and time that Jia Zhenke is filming. Again, this is kind of one of his real... Um, uh, goals in filmmaking. Uh, the characters, as I noted, uh, speak in uh, in local dialect, uh, which is a kind of quite certainly in 1994 was a quite radical move in Chinese cinema, which had traditionally kind of um, been almost exclusively um, or had almost exclusively used Mandarin. Um, so there's a sense that even within a Chinese context, there is a certain um, foreignness uh, denoted by the dialogue in the film, uh, which comes from most uh, clearly at at the start of the film where there's this kind of um, uh, rambling um, kind of monologue by this uh, unseen woman that is actually left unsubtitled either in Chinese or in uh, in English um, and is, I have been assured, as uh, incomprehensible to most Chinese ears as it it is to to non-Chinese ears, although I'd We'll defer to other people on that question. Uh, there is a, a real concern in the film for filming on the streets of Beijing, uh, showing them in a very kind of unvarnished, un, un kind of uh, manufactured uh, way. Uh, and also even the interiors of the film have a kind of, let's say, a, a real density of the real to them. Um, we, also, we see these kind of... Uh, uh, particularly the, the kind of houses uh, occupied by uh, Xiao Shen himself, are uh, essentially slums um, that um, you know, almost, almost create shocking uh, contrast with the wealth we see, uh, or the, at least the uh, consumer glut that we see uh, in other parts of the film. Um, in addition to this realist aesthetic, though, or in combination with this realist aesthetic, there are moments of... Uh, estrangement or even artifice. Uh, the visual field of the film, but particularly the soundtrack as well, is filled with media artifacts. And here I think we really need to listen to the soundtrack, uh, which is just kind of uh, almost bombarded with uh, kind of sonic extracts of TV shows, ads, radio, music. Uh, again, this is something that we see throughout a lot of Jar Jankar's work, particularly with the, his use of music, uh, almost this kind of running soundtrack uh, that goes throughout all these films and that we see already here, um, kind of uh, kind of confected through um, almost a, a, monta- a, a kind of sound montage of, of found uh, objects. Uh, as I uh, kind of cursorily noted uh, before, there is an experimental use of title cards uh, that in some ways I would argue, I mean, it has a kind of, uh, the, 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 the title cards he shows kind of looks somewhat like teletext, which was this, Thing in the 90s I don't know if anyone remembers it but uh, you could have kind of text on, on TV screens giving you the news or the weather or whatever um, it's something we don't have anymore uh, might just come up this is uh, this a very pr- provocative title card which I'll note in a second um, which is um, standing in for dialogue but even uh, later uh, and throughout the film we have these uh, kind of almost like like again, almost a, a, tr- a found f- found object text here, which is a, a, the TV guide for that given day, where we see the listings for all the different programs. Uh, we also have things like um, kind of um, like dating ads and newspaper articles and so on and so forth transformed into text and just kind of thrown on the screen like this. It creates uh, a, a kind of interesting uh, and I think actually quite a fascinating uh, uh, visual, but kind of informative but also kind of visual or, or aesthetic effect um we see also i mean again as a document of the 90s we see people's pages numbers pop up on the screen uh, people being called on their pages constantly um again this is something uh, as a technique that jaja Kerr might uh or, or does adopt uh in subsequent films of his uh thinking of still life for example with the use of uh, kind of title cards there uh or even certain other kind of interludes 
that appear in other films of his, like the kind of uh, brief animation sequences in the world. Um, so there are also kind of moments in the film that depart from the otherwise uh, prevailing, uh, let's say, hand, rough handheld style. Uh, even uh, quite early in the film, we see, uh, whoops, this, uh, this shot here is actually, it's hard, you can't tell this from this still, but this is actually a very long lateral tracking shot, um, kind of tracking right across the table and then ending up on uh, Xiao Shan himself, uh, which is actually repeated twice in the film, first in black and white and then in color. And it's very, you know, it really stands out given uh, the nature of the rest of the film. Uh, there is also, I think, a very uh, interesting use of montage in the film. And so uh, Zha Zhangke is a filmmaker, I mean, he has, he takes inspiration from the neorealists uh, who are kind of known for, for kind of uh, moving away from a kind of montage aesthetic, let's say. Uh, but uh, he's a filmmaker who doesn't see necessarily a kind of contradiction between a kind of neorealist aesthetic on the one hand, a long take aesthetic, uh, and kind of um, incorporating moments of montage in his film on the other hand. Um, so most notably, uh, we see here uh, this kind of very long, handheld, shaky, uh, uh, kind of mobile shot of Xiao Shan working, walking through a, a tunnel in the Beijing subway. Uh, and it's kind of very murky and bleak and kind of grimy. And he himself is in this kind of uh, kind of economically desperate situation. And then we cut to this kind of billboard for, uh, I'm not sure what that exactly is for, um, which uh, is possibly kind of today a, a banal site in China, but in 1994, uh, assuredly uh, less so, but certainly the, the aesthetic impact of that kind of very blunt cut uh, to this kind of, uh, uh, signifier of uh, the kind of uh, rise of uh, capitalism within China in the Deng Xiaoping uh, era is um, is very starkly presented uh, to the viewer. Uh, there are also moments where we could say there is a kind of montage within the frame. Uh, here we see uh, Xiao Shan's uh, kind of uh, his 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 house, I guess, or his, but it's a, it's just kind of a sl hovel, a, a slum, kind of a bidonville. Uh, and directly across the road from it is this kind of gleaming modern uh, tower block. So again, the kind of, uh, the social contrast um, that are already uh, kind of um, becoming um, trenchantly felt in China are, are shown very vividly um, by, uh, uh, by Jia Zhangke, and it's, this is a sense in which uh, I think we said that he's a kind of, uh, Jia Zhangke as a filmmaker is a kind of seismograph of transformation, is the kind of principle of the of the series, and here we really do get a kind of seismograph of the the rise of uh, of, of capitalism within China. Um, Xiao Shan as a character is completely deprived of any social safety net that we might associate with a kind of socialist system, uh, and instead uh, that kind of uh, material, uh, let's say, guarantee is replaced with the uh, unfulfilled yearning for consumer goods, uh, which seems to become, you know, his kind of, uh, well, certainly for the characters in the film, uh, their, their major raison d'etre. This is cr crystallized particularly in the character of Wang Xia, a kind of sometime girlfriend of Xiao Shen who resorts to prostitution to finance her consumer lifestyle. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is Xiao Shen here. She's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Wang Xia here. Uh, she uh, um, is clearly much better dressed than uh, Xiao Shen, uh, but it's clear uh, how she has made that possible, uh, which produces this uh, title card that you see here, uh, which, you know, again, in a, in a uh, uh, is, is provocative in any context, but probably more so in a context of China in 1994, um, Chinese cinema in 1994 at least. Uh, the, this, this, this conversation uh, between uh, Xiao Shan and Wang Sha is then followed by a kind of quietly devastating scene of uh, which takes up actually a reasonable chunk of the entire film uh, where we see the two of them wander through uh, market stalls uh, looking at clothing uh, but not buying anything because they can't afford it. And they constantly ask for the price of these items that they so uh, palpably desire but are always kind of rebuffed um, 
by the expense. And this, this thing kind of goes on for a long time. They explore uh, many different stalls and shops and so on and so forth, but never find that kind of fulfillment or that cathartic moment of actual, like, purchasing a consumer item. Um, so... Uh, obviously, Zhao Zhangke's uh, concern overall is, uh, I mean, I, I think the real, the through line for all his work is precisely uh, this attempt to uh, cinematically chronicle uh, China's industrial revolution and the same with, the, um, say, a, a writer like uh, Balzac uh, would have chronicled uh, the European industrial revolution of the 19th century, albeit in very different ways here. Uh, this... Uh, this process was still in its nascent stages uh, in 1994, but uh, the early signposts are definitely visible, whether it's the kind of the, the billboards or consumer items, uh, but also the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the architecture of the city, the, the, the infrastructure and so on and so forth that we see kind of um, in the process of modernization. Uh, it's uh, notable that this film was made only five years after the events of Tiananmen Square, which is kind of obliquely referred to in a title card and it's left very ambiguous as to whether uh, the reference to Tiananmen is to the protests or just the square. Uh, but there's a sense that the kind of crushing of these protests uh, governs a certain uh, generational mentality uh, on show in this film, which uh, kind of manifests itself in a kind of generalized uh, disengagement, aloofness, a lack of any kind of aspiration uh, beyond just kind of... Um, uh, individualistic desires uh, and you know there's no uh, sense of a kind of you know whether communist or democratic liberal or whatever uh, there's no sense of any kind of greater collectivity or whatever um, these are these are uh, atomized individuals that we see uh, there's a there's an, almost a sense and hopefully this is not overreading the film that there's a kind of unconscious trauma that is kind of um, uh, latently lurking uh, within all of the characters uh, and indeed the a kind of impending sense of violence that uh, pervades the whole film is actually made manifest uh, very late in the piece. I won't um, give any more details than that uh, so I don't want to ruin the ending by any means. Uh, finally though and I'll kind of begin to wrap things up here uh, I want to argue that this is I mean we can talk all about the kind of you know capitalism and consumerism and so on and so forth um, and, and uh, Chinese society and, and globalization and, and what have you. Uh, but I also want to just argue that this is a film about being young. Uh, it's a film about being young in the 90s, which is a strange time to be young, uh, as I can tell you from direct experience. Um, this is a film made by a 24-year-old about people in their 20s uh, and there's this, you know, that really palpably comes through in this film, I think. Um, Zhao Zhengke himself obviously was born in 1970. The characters in the film were, uh, are similarly aged. In a sense, this is a generation that in the West uh, would come to be dubbed Generation X. Uh, obviously, China is a totally different, um, let's say, generational framework there. But nonetheless, there's a, I mean, there are distinct parallels, let's say, between the characters we see in the film and the kind of trope of the slacker that was very like present in early to mid 90s culture, whether it's in Richard Leder's film Slacker, um, or, you know, I mean, even on a kind of more banal level, like kind of films like Reality Bites and so on and so forth in the United States. Uh, Zhao Zhang is on a, I would argue, on a kind of different aesthetic level, but the characters, uh, there, there, are re there are definitely resonances between them. Uh, in a sense, then, this film shows. Chinese youth as uh, being part of a kind of global 90s. This is the first decade uh, in, in, in history where the kind of globalization had really, really taken hold, obviously, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the kind of rampant um, neoliberalism uh, spreading across the world. Uh, we see here kind of cultural ramifications of that uh, in, in, in China. Uh, indeed, this, the kind of 90s, particularly, kind of, I would say, actually later in the 90s, uh, the NIST, but still part of the same decade, is a historical moment that has returned to obsessively in Zha Zhangke's work. So many of his films hark back to the 1990s, hark back uh, to, this, to this kind of t historical turning point uh, for China. Um, uh, it's obviously a turning point uh, from, um, let's say, a... a, a, a predominantly socialist and a uh, planned economy to a kind of free market economy 
kind of more state capitalist uh, economy, uh, but also uh, a turning point from a kind of, um, let's say, parochial Chinese culture to a globalized Chinese culture, um, or to Chinese culture as part of a kind of global culture. Uh, in that sense, a, a kind of a central scene in the film shows uh, Xiao Shan hanging out in his bedroom with uh, three old friends uh, from his hometown, uh, engaging in kind of drunken conversations that just go on and on and on and end up in kind of actually quite overtly misogynistic humor. Uh, tellingly, Zhao Zhenke plays one of these friends himself and, and actually plays by far the most annoying one. Um, so it wasn't averse to kind of uh, making fun of himself. Uh, but again, this, this kind of whole sequence is, I think, uh, uh, emblematic of this kind of slacker culture or slacker lifestyle uh, that seem to be kind of globally present. Uh, the film's kind of uh, grainy video aesthetic also plays into that kind of global cultural uh, edifice. Uh, this was a kind of uh, the use of kind of analog video in, in, in feature filmmaking. Uh, Came widespread in the 90s, famously with the Dogma 95 movement uh, in Denmark, uh, a film like uh, film, film with films like uh, The Idiots by Lars von Trier and The Celebration by Thomas Winterberg, um, which kind of made a huge splash, partly by virtue of showing um, kind of lo-fi video on on cinema screens, which was a very new phenomenon. But it, we can also think of um, you know even things like the Blair Witch Project, like, again a kind of a, 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 a very mundane. Um, uh, cultural reference point, um, but this is uh, this as an as an era. The '90s represented this kind of historical interlude between, uh, let's say, the celluloid era of cinema and the digital era, which kind of finally um, becomes all dominant uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and this is a moment where filmmakers actually have the ability to uh, combine and intermingle different film formats, different techniques, different, uh, let's say, visual approaches. Uh, and while Zha Zhang Ke is using the same kind of uh, uh, kind of image format throughout the whole film, I think that kind of uh, kind of uh, sense of, of of freedom about what a filmmaker can do pervades this film as well. Um, I would argue, however, that the soundtrack uh, provides an even more trenchant signifier of the changing cultural norms uh, brought about by globalization. Uh, as I as I noted, it's the whole film is kind of suffused with music, like pretty much all of Jia Chengke's films, and even pretty much all of China. Uh, but for the most part, this takes a form of this kind of sentimental Chinese pop ballads, um, which you know have a kind of uh, distinctly cheesy quality to them. Uh, at the end of the film, however, there is a distinct kind of uh, or abrupt kind of shift in the cultural framework of the music used on the soundtrack because for the first time we find the kind of prominent use of a, uh, of a Western song on the soundtrack. Uh, this song is um, possibly for the younger people in the audience, this will mean nothing to you, but the song is mm, 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 mm by the Crash Test Dummies. Uh, and uh, this is, I mean, in some sense, it's prestigious uh, Zha Zhenke's later use of these kind of um, Western songs in his films, whether it's kind of Go West by the Pet Shop Boys um, in um, Mountains Made Apart uh, or YMCA uh, in, in Ashes Purest White. Uh, but, uh, I mean, well, one thing to note about this, this, this song is, like, it's a terrible song. Uh, it's a very, I mean, even at the time, it was like considered pretty, let me tell you, like this is an area of expertise uh, of mine, considered a pretty lame song, uh, and it doesn't age well. Uh, the, crush, the Crush Test Dummies were not Nirvana. Uh, they weren't even like Pearl Jam. I mean, they were low on the, on the scale, right? Uh, and yet the, the way the song is used within the narrative context of, of Shao Shan going, uh, going home elevates... Uh, the banality of the lyrics and the and the music uh, to something I would argue kind of almost transcendental. Uh, in this sense, it's actually rather similar to the way, uh, for instance, Claire Denis uses uh, "Rhythm of the Night," another '90s anthem uh, in "Beau Travail," which is the quality of the, the, one of the great things about the cinema. Let me just say this now: is that it can take trash and turn it into gold. Uh, <laughs> on an aesthetic level. And this is what Zhao Zhang Ke manages to do at the end of the film. He takes this trashy song and 
through whatever emotional or visual resonances, uh, he has to, this kind of innate talent to turn it into this uh, transcendental uh, moment of cinema, I would argue. Uh, you might have a different opinion, but uh, that, that's my point of view. Uh, and clearly this is something that only the great filmmakers uh, are capable of, only the auteurs, to get back to my original like uh, kind of disreputable uh, conceptual category. Uh, only auteurs like Claire Denis, like Charles Jean Kerr, uh, have this ability. Uh, and this is evident even in, even in uh, Charles Jean Kerr's first film, which is, uh, if you think about it, actually quite incredible. Um, so I want to just now, uh, to end up, uh, and to fast forward uh, from 1994 um, with, yeah, and this discussion of crash test dummies and, and the relative merits of 90s um, uh, alt pop music uh, to 2019, the present, uh, and where the scrappy ingenue uh, who made Xiao Chang going home has become something of a grand old man of Chinese cinema. He's now nearly 50. It's incredible to believe, but yes. Uh, he has attained uh, kind of almost rock star levels of popularity amongst the young in China. I mean, this is something that... Uh, you know, I mean, he's like from Western equivalents, maybe like a Tarantino or something, um, or a Scorsese. Uh, this is even uh, notable in the Chinese uh, diaspora. I remember um, uh, seeing him in, at the Melbourne International Film Festival. Uh, Melbourne has a very large Chinese population, and he was absolutely mobbed and uh, like kind of, um, you know, screaming fans uh, as if the Beatles had come to like um, town. Uh, and uh, he's also um, become something of, let's say, a, a mogul uh, in a way, on a, at least on a minor level. Uh, Professor Hedegger uh, noted last week that he's uh, established a, a film festival uh, in his home region, uh, in the kind of ancient city of Pingyao in Shaanxi province. Uh, I had the privilege to attend this festival this year, so I got to see the festival firsthand. Um, and the, the kind of the mogul-like qualities of Jaja and Kerr became uh, very visible uh, when I was just kind of, I don't know, walking along the street and I see him coming out of a building with like half a dozen henchmen on each side, all wearing like black suits. Uh, and Jar Jan Kerr was smoking his big fat cigar and just like walking and like, I, like he looked like a, a mafia don or something. Uh, maybe a, 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 an image he's trying to play up. He actually played in a, in a, uh, in um, A Touch of uh, Sin, uh, a kind of gangster figure already. So he likes that image, maybe. Uh, to establish the Pingyao Film Festival, however, I mean, he managed to achieve major financial backing from the regional government. Um, so he know, And he's involved in film production, now he's involved in setting up this film festival, uh, really being able to speak to the right people, the people who control the purse strings. Uh, he managed to... Uh, obtained the services of Marco Mueller as artistic director, who's one of the real big names in uh, film programming. Uh, and yet, you know, where he does have maybe this, this mafioso kind of like ability uh, to him. Uh, he's still doing it for all the right reasons. Uh, Ping Yao is a festival dedicated to a real cinephilic idea of, uh, of the film festival. So it's not just a kind of tourism showcase as so many other film festivals are programming is, is incredibly strong and uh, it's a key part of its uh, kind of, I guess, mission. Uh, it seeks to showcase new filmmaking talent in independent Chinese cinema, uh, often filmmakers who would otherwise be marginalized within the Chinese uh, film industry. Uh, so it's a very concerted effort by Jia Shanke. Now that he's kind of reached a, a kind of uh, an elder statesman uh, uh, level of trying to unearth the new Jajan Kerrs of future generations who will be able to do, hopefully, for the 2010s and em imminently for the 2020s, what indeed Jajan Kerr with films like Shaoshan Going Home did for the 1990s. Uh, so I wanted to end it there. Uh, enjoy the screening. It's 59 minutes long, so it's, it's short and sweet. Uh, and then we'll come back for some discussions. I'd particularly like to discuss the ending with you because I... I have, have, have some, you know, questions myself about that ending. Uh, so, yes, enjoy the screening. So, yeah, um, thanks, Daniel, again for, for your talk. And there's uh, a lot of things, I think, like you, you said it nicely, like it's 
doesn't look like it's like a big film, but there's lots of nice things in there, and I think there's lots of things we can uh, talk about. Perhaps we can start, yeah, from the from the end, or <laughs> like you already announced how how that would be something to be discussed. And um, I think there are a lot of um, references there that might also be. Uh, not at first for everybody very clear. Uh, I'm not a specialist, but from the uh, the one thing that I discovered researching about this film, um, the first time I watched preparing for for this um, for this evening, is this uh, tradition or this uh, yeah this kind of tradition from Chinese culture that it's bad luck to have a haircut uh, in the first months of the Chinese year. So the fact that he's having his haircut shortly before the, the new year. Uh, has to do with that, but like I said, I'm not a specialist, and that because I was like, why is he having a haircut, and what's have to do with anything, or and some might just read it like, yeah, like uh, um, I don't know that this it means that he didn't get home and he's staying there, or like it starts to read a lot. But I thought it was interesting to know this this part about as a the the hair get, getting a haircut having to do with something traditional or something. Uh, some, some kind of mysticism perhaps related to to the tradition there which is then something very um, perhaps opposite to the whole more uh, what you were talking about how uh, this clash between old and new and between um, old uh, tradition and new consumerism and everything how, how this is all being portrayed in the film as well I don't know if you know anything about that or if you uh, what how does that connect to your personal reading of the end of the film or no not? I, I, I didn't know about that uh, that about that superstition which is interesting um, you, like you have a deadline to get a haircut um, maybe I need that as well <laughs> in my life um, my wife would definitely agree with that uh, no but I mean I, well the, what I was wondering at least and I, I'd like to even throw it out to the audience if people can get their personal reactions I mean that's a that's an interesting like layer to add on to it but it seems like I mean first of all this character has long hair which means a couple of things one or it could mean a couple of things uh one is it a kind of rebelliousness um you know he's, a, you know, he's not gonna not the clean cut like um like go-getting type of guy but he's got this long hair and bedraggled and so on and so forth or is it a just kind of aloofness and a kind of like a dissipation or a kind of uh kind of an, an apathy just he can't even be bothered to cut his hair uh, either way, I mean, we seem to have this whole, we seem to have this like lack of progression in the character throughout the whole film. That there's like he doesn't seem to really like develop in any way or like get. I mean, he has this goal, but it's never, he's never going to get there, and so on and so forth. Um, his life seems totally stuck in a rut. Seems kind of completely uh, without any form of kind of. Um, like advancement whether socially or personally or whatever uh and then he gets this haircut at the end and is that is that this moment is he kind of submitting to order at that moment is he like all right i'll get my haircut and get a job and blah blah, blah like become a productive member of society or is he is it like which is the kind of negative like the end of the rebellious phase of youth and he's going to kind of become conformist or is it you know we could put a more positive glean on it is it a kind of uh actually he's kind of kind of leaving his funk leaving his rut is he kind of like moving on with his life kind of you know does he have a kind of a fresh start a new haircut so he can like do new things with himself or whatever um or is it just meaningless i mean it could just be or it's just that sometimes he gets a haircut, haircut is once a year sorry? before the new year's or it's just yeah or he he just oh, it's just the super <laughs> like if i don't it'll you know, be bad luck i just like you know is, is it just it's sometimes a, in the cinema a haircut is just a haircut and you know in life as well um so but i i'd be interested to hear like audience responses to that ending and also the kind of the because also the, i mean there's the, the crash test dummies that i talked about but then there's uh, the the Chinese song as well. That's kind of like, like they're creating this bizarre oral like mishmash. Um, that doesn't quite. I mean, there's no, there's no symphony there. It's a totally like disharmonic or whatever um, uh, juxtaposition of, of musical kind of uh, elements at that point. And then we also see this kind of haircut taking place, and and with the, um, I mean, it's gone back to black and white. But there's also the uh, we see the tower blocks in the background again as this kind of like, uh, 
you know, it, whatever's happening to this character, there's stuff happening to China, which is it's urbanizing, it's modernizing, it's going through this construction boom. Uh, and you can kind of see that in the, in the background of so many shots in the film. And this shot kind of like really hammers that home as well. But, Does anybody yeah. want to react right away to this? Uh, or do you have any other readings about the ending? Or <laughs> no. Uh, I, yeah, that would be. <laughs> One second, I'll bring you the mic so everybody can hear. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Xuan. I'm from Hafke Offenbach. So, <laughs> first, uh, Jia Zhangke is one of my favorite film uh, director. And uh, as a Chinese girl, I would say, yes, that means something. Before the new year, you cut your hair. It's definitely not good. <laughs> But I read some uh, um, critique uh, from the Chinese view. I think it means something uh, negative, as kind of like a uh, kind of give up because he tried several, like uh, I see he go to different friends. Uh, I don't know if it's really friends, but he tried if he... Um, I'm not really clear, but it seems so. He tried to find a companion that can go back to China together, but he failed. So I think that's the last thing I feel is also a kind of failure because you cut your hair, especially in his um, in lower class people, they are really careful about hair dress before the new year of mm -hmm. China. <laughs> No, but I think it's important what you mentioned there that uh, there's this kind of kind of constant attempt by Shaoshan to make kind of a human connection, or like not a concerted attempt, but a kind of half-assed attempt or something to like. You, you know, he got to, fired. To make, yeah, he he want yeah. to find from some like uh, warmth from the friends or yeah, who yeah. can really. But, but he doesn't get he doesn't get anything from anyone. Yeah, there's sympathy. this kind of constant failure to connect with anyone. But I feel a little um, bit angry how he treat the girl with the red. Uh, with the red coat, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like he use her as a kind of like a sex something then, yeah, in a way. So I think uh, there's a phrase in China, the tragic people must be something. Why he's tragic? <laughs> Because I think his behavior also kind of... Um, yeah, yeah. I, this result, yeah. yeah. In English, we'd say like the fatal flaw or the tragic oh, yeah. flaw of the, of the character. So like the tragedy always comes from oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a kind of character flaw exactly. rather than just like lots of bad stuff happened to them coincidentally. Like there's But something I, internal <laughs> that uh, that brought about this tragic fate. Um, that scene is another really ambiguous moment and again highlights I think the Jia Zhangke's skill as a as a filmmaker that the scene with the with the woman in the red coat and the, because I read one interpretation of the film that basically calls it a rape but it's not that it, like we don't see But the girl is laughing that's really making exactly, me like Exactly like that's the ambiguity <laughs> she's resisting then she's laughing then they're riding a bicycle together so oh, where kind of, I mean really, our, losing, our yeah. post me too interpretation of this film blah 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 I don't know. It's it, like it's initially quite violent and forceful, and then I don't know what happens. And he doesn't show us the, you know, he he withdraws some crucial information uh, from us, which I think lends to the ambiguity of this film. Is this guy Xiao Shan? Is he a, a lovable loser uh, that we should sympathize with, or is he just a total scumbag who like we're like ah, oh, you know? It's also typical like, in a short films because it's only 56 minutes, so it's the yeah. storytelling have some charming, uh, like sweet short, but also yeah. have some limitations. Yeah, yeah. But uh, even in the, I mean, even in these longer films, he has this uh, oh, propensity yeah. to kind of like just just leave out certain key moments or leave leave key information in the narratives yeah. ambiguous or, or kind of elided, uh, so that the spectator has to kind of fill in things and and kind of. You know, there's a room. There's a, a room for ambiguity left in a lot of his films, uh, which I think is is one of his kind of. For real me, it's also first qualities. time see this work. He's quite young. It's uh, in his university time, and himself yeah. in the film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Funny. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, strangely enough, uh, just to, this is again purely anecdotally. There was this like promo uh, that was screened at the Pinyao Film Festival for this film by another Chinese filmmaker, Cheng Er. Uh, and the film is called Pseudo Idealist, and it stars Jia Zhangke as this kind of, uh, kind of like a, a, a kind of dissipated intellectual figure, kind of constantly talking about Descartes and, and subjectivity and so on and so on. But like, there's like a naked woman next to him and stuff. Um, and this is billed as like Jia Zhangke's first like starring role as an actor. But he had a little like, not starring role, but there was a kind of a. He had a pretty uh, interesting scene in this film, I found. 
um, yeah. Um, perhaps to jump right into the beginning, I wanted to ask you another question, and that's uh, right in the beginning with this um, this title that says uh, commemorating 100 years of cinema. Uh, what's your reading? What that has? What's the place of that there? I mean, like he's he's like he's a student. He's making this uh, this film, and he's already aiming to like make this as an homage to 100 years of cinema. How um, sounds a little bit pretentious, I think, but I don't know. Uh, I think I mean I read it as a as a joke, uh, to be honest. Like as a provoca yeah a provocation to like there's this film student who's no one who no one's heard of. At the same time, obviously, what was happening at this this time. Uh, 1995 was there were all these like big commemorative projects for celebrating 100 years of cinema and you'd have these like omnibus films with like 20 different like of the world's greatest directors like making a film together and like Kurosawa and, and this and that and so on and so forth um and here's this like total like uh, you know precocious youngster like 24 years old and he's like commemorating 100 years of this I mean it's 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 a it's a real provocation uh, but you know, again, this is, he's, uh, I think that's something he's retained also is this ability to kind of like stick the needle in sometimes. Uh, and this is, this, I read it at least as, as one of those times. That said, I mean, he is a filmmaker who more than many other filmmakers is really concerned deeply with the history of the cinema. Obviously he was studying it at this time, but I think this comes through in a lot of his films and just a lot of his uh, interviews and statements and so on. And so he's something that's incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, and that's not often the case for filmmakers about the history of the medium. Um, and who I think, you know, he's incorporating the history of the medium into his own films. And actually, uh, I mean, and I've, I wondered about this because there's another film of his, which we'll be watching later, 24 city, where previously watching it, I was like, oh, now that is like, there's this scene of a factory. And I was like, well, that is like a, a nod to the Lumiere brothers, which sounds preposterous, but then. He's dedicated this to a hundred years of film of cinema, and the Lumiere Brothers was a hundred years earlier, so they, you know the birth of the cinema. So maybe not so preposterous to to make those kind of connections. Uh, he would, I mean, he would have been shown these films by his professors, who, for whatever sadistic reasons, like showing their students uh, films like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, Twenty Four City will be screening here in January, so stick around for the series to know what he's talking about. <laughs> We have a question in the back. One second. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the ending. Um, do you think it's possible that he, especially because he's drunk and singing that song and talking about how it's hard to forget, that maybe the haircut is some t uh, attempt to like shed his past and forget all this hardship that he went through? when he wasn't even able to get a ticket for a train and just tries to like let all that go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think that's a totally valid like uh, way of reading that scene. Um, that, yeah, it's this kind of sh shedding of the weight, of, you know, this, that's kind of keeping him down or whatever. But uh, the, the, again, this is what's interesting is that uh, Zhao Zhang doesn't really direct us one way or the other in how to read this scene. He just shows us the haircut. He doesn't, you know, there's no there's no freighting of that scene with any kind of overt symbolism or overt, like, interpretation or whatever. Um, that, uh, so we're kind of, fr we're kind of, fr as spectators, free to give it the meaning we want to try to figure out the character, try to kind of interpret, uh, you know, what's happening to him, where he's going. Um, what, what is that a turning point or is it just a continuation of the same uh i even tried resorting to deciphering the lyrics to um, 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 but that didn't give me very far um as a kind of largely nonsensical lyrics uh unfortunately uh so there's like your interpretation is totally valid uh but i wouldn't like go so far as to say like yes that's the right reading you know it's like we uh there are multiple possible uh, ways, I think, of of, of of understanding that final scene. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, what I found interesting is also what you meant, that it has a certain secu uh, circularity. And that's what I kind of uh, meant by that. Because, it, hmm. I mean, a haircut is bound to lead to uh, 
repeat itself. Another hacker. Yeah, the hacker is back and you got to get another one and so on and so forth for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, so that's, yeah. I know that, there's, that's a good, I like that actually as a way of under, underscoring that kind of cyclicality that seems to be uh, the, the, the underlying structure of the film. Um, yeah. Any other questions here? If not, I would like to go back to one point that you made in your talk about this being like uh, the 90s and this being like representative to a certain culture and something that was also um, elements of it that were also being perhaps uh, in a globalized form also present in, in other places. I was actually looking for those points this time that I was watching the film. I, did, I, I think for me, when I first watched it, I, I definitely... I had some connection to this video uh, aesthetics of the film, like this uh, format reminded me of something very 90s. Um, but then I don't know, I don't, I, perhaps you could elaborate that a little bit more because perhaps also being a little bit younger, I didn't have, I was, well, a child in the 90s, perhaps I didn't have exactly the same, I didn't know the mm, song before, like, I perhaps, uh, maybe I, perhaps it wasn't I knew big in it Brazil. when, it, when it I was like, yeah, perhaps it was wasn't big in Brazil. It was huge in Australia for whatever yes. reason uh, and you couldn't avoid that I, song for... Uh, I, was, I wasn't sure, like when I saw it from like, does it sounded kind of uh, um, that I would know it, but I didn't know, I wouldn't have known the band or anything. So I shazam the, the film <laughs> at home and I was like, ah, oh, okay, this is the song. Um, also to know what it was about the song, to know if there was a meaning to the lyrics or something. But, um, but that this emotional background of the song, for example, that you brought in your talk, I didn't have. So I was, um, but that's one point. But I, thought, I don't know, are there other elements in the film that you thought were... What, what did you think were so representative to this kind of global um, youth in the 90s or something? Um, what made you think that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest, it's more the, it was primarily the, the characters uh, who I felt like I could have been watching a Richard Linklater film or, uh, you know, or any number of these kind of slacker comedies from uh, the United States in particular that were like prevalent in that, in that period. And so it's, it's quite intriguing to find this kind of, uh, Chinese equivalent of it that, which which seems strange on on one hand because the historical markers are so different for China than they are uh, for the for Western countries uh, at this point certainly, but clearly there's some kind of cultural confluence going on at, at this particular moment, probably for the first time. Um, and beyond that, I mean, just just weird little things like the fashion, like the the use of pages and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, uh, I mean, but there are also other things where you see a, I think, a, a, almost a time capsule of a lost world or something that, you know, of a, of a Beijing that no longer exists uh, as a city that has been so, like, rapidly transformed. And it, we're in the middle of that transformation, but, but like, you know, we're at that kind of turning point where there's still this kind of... Um, uh, uh, these kind of elements of the old meeting elements of the new and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, uh, I mean, just the, uh, like the, I don't know, sometimes you see blue sky and that seems to be <laughs> not so frequently the case anymore in Beijing. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, we can see that even just the, the, the transformation of the urban space, uh, in front of our eyes. That is really one of the, the real, like, I mean, one of the big stories of human history, I think, is what's happening to China and its urban domain uh, in particular. Um, yeah, I think it's just small things like that, the fashion, the music, the the, the kind of the media, um, like ju just that, that kind of media, like background noise that seems to be uh, just a constant in the film um, that, I mean, even though it's Chinese and, and not my own like cultural background, just seems to have encapsulated something about that, about that period. I was also curious, but whether, whether there was more of an inter, um, interchange, like a cultural uh, exchange between China and Australia, and perhaps there were things there that, perhaps related to um, whatever was uh, because you also mentioned the the strong. Um, Chinese community in Australia, so yeah. I was also thinking whether that perhaps also has an influence in. Um, in your perception of this particular environment, but nothing that you... Yeah, I don't know. I have that, background, uh, but but per, I on, a per, on a perfectly, on a personal note, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood that was like 40% Chinese uh, and 
was like Shanghai's. Uh, so there's like the like massive strip of Shanghai restaurants, but all Shanghai cuisine. So different from Beijing. It's in Melbourne or uh, in yeah. Sydney, actually. In Sydney, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the connection. My personal connection is for food, uh, is, um, and uh, um, but but uh, but uh, I guess a, a certain um, I don't know a certain vibe in here. But that's very. That's we're getting into very. <laughs> ephemeral, uh, ephemeral oh, and there are moments of of uh, eating and, and and restaurant in the film as well, which I also think are interesting because it's either him eating by himself and uh, uh, his uh, well the, the girlfriend the the woman just watching and then later it's his brother eating and he's just watching and it's like uh it's not really there's always something out of place there in this mm. in these moments mm. of uh yeah and, and even right at the start i mean we see him as a kitchen hand just kind of yeah. like and he like he's the worst kitchen hand in the world i mean he's like like he can't even hold a knife properly and his <laughs> boss is just losing like his patience with this guy um i mean uh, the, the, the boss is kind of a caricature of a of like a an asshole rich guy but also like you can kind of see his point of view. This guy doesn't belong in a kitchen with like sharp implements and stuff. <laughs> uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, and, and it's also uh, good that you mentioned the, the the boss there in the restaurant because um, I thought it was in, we kind of almost have more information about him than about uh, Xiao Shan in the beginning mm -hmm. because of this. Uh, we get the personal this, ad, which is also like this nineties like phenomenon yeah. that you know, like I mean, we have Tinder now, or whatever, like. Um, but yeah, like, and he, we find out what like he likes sad music and traveling to windy places or whatever it was. Uh, whereas uh, Xiao Shan is a very opaque character. Um, we don't know much about him. Uh, we don't know. I mean, he's kind of this like, uh, like very affectless uh, figure. Like we don't, we can't like. It's hard to pierce his psychology in a way. Like he's kind of always got this mask up in front of himself. Like towards the viewer, but also towards the other characters in the film. He doesn't let his guard down. Um, I think it, it's a very poignant moment with that girlfriend figure who he has where they're like, you know, she like can't even get an emotion out of him mm. in a way. And that's just like, uh, he, he's kind of resistant to that. Um, to Again, resistant to this kind of like, he wants to make, the, he wants to make these human connections, but at the same time, he doesn't like go all in on them. He doesn't like, doesn't really like, uh, uh, le like open himself up to to that possibility. I think it's interesting. This remind me of this anecdote about how he chose, or about the moment when he chose this um, the actor to to play mm -hmm. Shaoshan Wang, who was, uh, as is mentioned, is a friend yeah. of his and everything. And um, he apparently. In, in a acting class uh, was uh, named by the teacher as the worst student in the class, as the worst act, acting student. So we're here like super interpreting how he represents this character as like not showing emotions and everything. And perhaps uh, I, I just I just thought about it now. At some moment, somebody said, this guy's a bad actor. He's just not expressing any emotion. But perhaps that's also what makes this character so interesting in this case of this film. So I just think it's uh, um, it just reminded me of this uh, Anecdote. Yeah, but also it's because Zhao Zhang I mean, he doesn't want this kind of yeah, conventionalized acting that would be really like hyper emotional or like really like studied or mannered. Yeah, or he wouldn't belong he to this film. To, exactly. I mean, and that it's, he wants this kind of like, uh, he wants an actor who can't act or who doesn't <laughs> act, you know, who just is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, and I think you can see that, you see that also with Xiao Tao in his films, um, it's like where she is just like, embodying this figure rather than trying to like act a figure or whatever. So I think that's definitely a, a deliberate um, uh, approach by uh, Zhao Zhang Ke rather than just like, oh, I've got this bad actor and like yeah. he, he doesn't know how to like act, so I'm stuck with him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I definitely yeah. think it's it's part of the the whole thing, and that's yeah. Said, and he's a fascinating. Well. I mean, yeah, I find him a fascinating person to like relate to or trying to like, even though he doesn't let his guard down. It's like you you there's a kind of charisma to the to the to the actor uh, that he also imparts to the character that even even in spite of his flaws, you still respond to him in a way. Uh, and I think this comes out also in in Pickpocket, the the following film, uh, and 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 kind of. Uh, there it becomes really full on, I think, particularly in the, towards the end of that film. Um, Big pocket, which we'll also be showing in the program later the next year. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience, or comments, or impressions about the film, or any more reactions, thoughts, <laughs> wishes? <laughs> 
Um, this is, if not, this is good because this is like a record early finish for yeah. when we were like, <laughs> oh, it's like one hour film, it's two, not two thirty or whatever. And yeah. Yeah, no, but the short film is real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. We can uh, wrap up here in case there are no more questions. Um, and the next uh, lecture will be at the end of the month on the twenty eighth of November. We'll be watching the world, which is a rather long film, also more than two hours long. Um, it's uh, unfortunately printed wrongly here in this slide. So um, check out the <laughs> the monthly program of the DFF for the exact information or the website. I'll um, promise that we'll try to keep the most updated information on the website always. So if you're in doubt, if the, what's printed is like, you're not sure, check out the website. Um, and Dudley Andrew will be Yeah. Dudley Andrew will be Exactly. And Dudley Andrew will be here to give the speech, uh, the, the lecture beforehand. And so I'll hope you all be back here at the end of the month so we can talk more about Cha Jong Thank you very much. Have a good evening and this next month. Tai Chen. <laughs>